It's me, Kimberly, and I want to let you in on a little secret. I know deep down many of you aspire to be podcasters too. I also know exactly how frustrating it can be to figure out how to get started. Well, I'm going to tell you just how easy it is with Anchor. If you haven't heard of Anchor and how it's the easiest way to make a podcast, allow me to give you the details. Anchor is free. Yes, free. I don't pay for any subscriptions or have any wacky fees to pay. There are creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast from your phone or computer, which is everything in and of itself for podcasters on the go. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership, which is awesome sauce too. Anchor is literally everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Take the leap and download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started today. All right, all right, all right. Welcome back, listeners, to another episode of What Had Happened, a true crime podcast. I am your host, Kimberly, bringing you lesser-known true crime stories. I want to thank you all for coming and checking out this little true crime podcast of mine. I also want to like encourage you guys again to join the What Had Happened Facebook group family, um, as well as the Instagram and Twitter accounts that I don't really mess with too hard. Um... All links are below in the description box, Um, as always, along with the references that I obtained for each episode. Um, I am so excited, you guys. I mean, we have been exceeding any of the expectations that I had um, as far as listenership is going, and I'm so happy you guys just keep breathing life into me to keep on going. So... Why the hell not give you guys literally like the third episode for this month? Um, so let's see here. Um, our last episode, I discussed serial killer Richard Cottingham, who raped, tortured, and murdered countless women in New York and New Jersey for 13 years. Today, I will be telling you what had happened at the hands of killer couple Alvin and Judith Neely. Uh, So I gained a substantial amount of information on this crime from Season 1, Episode 10 of ID's Wicked Attraction entitled Hearts of Darkness. Also, special shout out to the True Crime Guys. They, True Crime Guys podcast is one of my personal favorite podcasts in the true crime realm to listen to. And boy, oh boy they did a lot of heavy lifting for me as far as giving me some of the background information about this couple so you know if you want to hear another perspective on this go ahead and give them a listen as well love you guys love michael and lauren um also i found some books again all of the references are in the description box below so here we go let's get into it Alvin Howard Neely Jr. was born on July 15, 1953 in Tryon, Georgia. Growing up, Alvin Jr. was, let's see here, described as being super cute and like a happy child. He was also described as being, like, he was also the youngest of three children. His older brother and sister adored him. As a boy, Alvin lived the post-war era and like, post-war era all-american life alvin was a cub scout and he was also the class clown 
As a teenager, though, cute little Alvin with the bright blonde hair and big blue eyes, who was the life of the party and charismatic, had many run-ins with the law. Shoplifting and car theft, and essentially an overall grifter, was what Alvin grew into. Having had a charmed life as the baby of the family and beloved by the town in general, Alvin, one, peaked as a teenager, and two, lacked the drive to do anything besides hustle his way through life day to day. In 1975, he married Frances Atkins in Bradley, Tennessee. By 1979, the couple would have three children together. Judith Ann Adams was born on June 7, 1964, in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Judith was the middle child of five children, with an older brother and sister and two younger brothers. Judith's father, Jim, who worked in construction and did carpentry on the side, was the glue that held the family of seven together. Barbara, Judith's mother, was a homemaker. The family of seven lived cramped in a trailer until he started his own construction company, affording the family to live a little bit more comfortably. Like, they were still, don't get it twisted, they stayed in a trap. Okay? So, for some of my hood-ass listeners, they stayed in the trap, they stayed in the hood, they stayed in, like, I mean, like, okay, so at the time, the way that Murfreesboro was described, and I'm really trying to be so polite about it, is it was kind of trashy. Well, not necessarily trashy, but super rural, and in the area in which the Adams family lived. <laughs> Sorry, I had to fucking do it. That's not even in the script. Um, in the area that the Adams family lived in, it was quote unquote trashy. Period. Like, there's no other way to fucking dress this up or down. <sighs> So, but anyways, dad was making some more money, so it afforded the family to live a little bit more comfortably, you know, like, I mean, you know, Barbara could feed the family of seven and not really, like, have a bead of sweat on her brow. And, you know, the children didn't go without, you know, the necessities and things of that nature, per my assumption from the description of the family. Anywho, Judith was described as an intelligent child who liked to play with her dolls, was introverted, and wanted to be a nurse when she grew up. Unfortunately, at the age of nine, Judith's world was set off kilter when her father died in a motorcycle accident. Extremely close to her father, Judith retreated further inside of herself when he died. Judith's mother quickly went through the pension money she received from her husband's death. In order to provide for her family for a little while, Barbara did do factory work until she had her, until she herself was involved in a car accident and quit her job. After the death of her husband, many said that the widow developed a reputation for promiscuity. At one point, Barbara was charged with contributing to the delinquency of a minor for carrying on a relationship with a teenage boy. Barbara then went on to purchase a CB radio where she could correspond and hook up with men using the handle Cherokee Princess. Babs claimed to be half Cherokee. It wasn't long before men began showing up at all hours to visit Barbara for sex. Barbara and Judith shared the same bedroom in their cramped trailer with just a blanket dividing the room and providing, quote, privacy. But of course, young Judith could hear, smell, and see many things she shouldn't have. Before long, Judith became a full-time, oh no, Barbara became a full-time sex worker, pulling her dates off the CB radio. Judith was disgusted with her mother, her piss-poor older siblings who did nothing, and the overall disintegration of her family following the death of her father. Judith would spend the next few years trying to apply herself scholastically to get out of her trashy environment, as well as fighting off the advances of her mother's clients. Judith lived a Cinderella-like existence. After attending school, Judith would come home, do all of the household chores, tend to her younger siblings because nobody else in the fucking house would do any of them, study, do her homework, and listen to her mother having sex with clients. 
Resentful as fuck for the life that her mother led, Judith didn't date and was resolute at remaining a virgin. So it's 1979 and she's 15 years old waiting for her Prince Charming to arrive. It's 1979, a 26-year-old Alvin is a husband, father, and small-time hustler. Francis would later tell investigators that Alvin was an extremely abusive and violent spouse during their marriage. Others disagree, but this is what Francis said. Also, people are on the fence just because of the further the events that would unfold as to whether or not Francis was um, stretching the truth as far as her relationship with Alvin. But nonetheless, that's, that's just a sidebar. So Alvin was also a womanizer, and this is when the planets collided and Alvin meets 15-year-old Judith. So in 1980, Alvin's... Okay, his brother or friend so I heard brother I heard and saw like I was watching the documentary and they said brother but I read in a couple of books and articles that it was a friend so I'm unsure however someone developed a crush for Indian princess over the CB because you know she was all whisper 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 talking about all of the salacious things that she would do to men over the CB radar, radio breaker breaker and so Alvin was being a good bro and he went along to be a, a good wingman with his brother slash friend I don't know which one when a date was finally arranged with Indian princess it was during this date that Alvin and Judith met he was 26 she was 15 while Alvin wasn't on her level intellectually, again, he was charismatic and different from the other men who frequented the trailer and basically just, you know, pawed at Judith and were unsolicited with their advances towards this young lady. It wasn't long before Judith was breaking the vow she made to herself and began having sex and eventually running away to be with Alvin who also left his wife to be with Judith. Initially, the two slept in Alvin's car. It wasn't long before the unkempt teenager became pregnant but miscarried. The couple decided to drive across the country and pick up odd jobs along the way to make money to survive. At one point, the two were working together at a convenience store, or conveniently, hey -o, but a bunch. Alvin basically hung around the register, like, you know, shooting the shit with the customers and bossing Judith around, telling her what to do, and also getting some hippity dippity on the side in the back room from time to time. Judith did all of this, and somehow Alvin had arranged for her to do it without being paid. So he was the only one getting paid, so he was getting paid to fuck his girlfriend. And he low key was kind of like a pimp in my personal opinion in that regard because she was doing all of the work and he was collecting all of the money in the summer of 1980 16 and pregnant judith married alvin with virtually no money judith and alvin blah, blah, judith and alvin began resorting to more nefarious means to make ends meet. In October 1980, Judith, heavily pregnant with twins, robbed a student in a quiet section of a shopping mall at gunpoint. Judith coldly stared at the girl and called her a bitch as she demanded her purse. Judith may have gotten away with this robbery had she not forged the checks in the purse. It didn't take long for Rome, Georgia police to apprehend Judith and remand her to the Macon Youth Development Center, which is basically Juvie. It was while Judith was in the custody of YDC that she gave birth to her twins. Alvin himself had been incarcerated for a myriad of offenses such as theft and scamming. The two corresponded through letters throughout their separation. 
The letters were a mixture of puppy dog love and infatuation, as well as control and assertion of dominance and paranoid thoughts of like third parties on both of their parts. So both of them were jealous of the other one and accusing them of having other lovers. So that happened, but I mean, that's, I'm not surprised. Are you surprised guys? Are you surprised? Are we surprised? No, we're not surprised. In the summer of 1981, Judith was released from the YDC, but was quickly arrested again for the th- for theft in a store. On December 1st, 1981, Judith was released again, but since Alvin was still incarcerated, she stayed with his family, like his rents. She stayed at his folks' house. After being released, the Neelys, Alvin, Judith, and their twins, that is, began driving around committing small crimes around the area of their home in Rome, Georgia. When the couple could afford it, they'd get cheap motel rooms. When they couldn't, they either couch surfed with family and friends or slept in their car. That's right, mommy, daddy, and the babies. Plural. The lifestyle was brutal, but Judith and Alvin embraced their, quote, freedom. Yeah, fuck that shit. I mean, like, listen, if you gotta struggle, you gotta struggle. But to be like, we're about this life. Woo. No. No, that's not freedom. That's that's not the business. Especially when you've got these babies and you're, like, committing a bunch of crimes. That's where this isn't freedom. You know what I mean? So September 11th, 1982, Judith decided to switch the direction of her angst and aggression. YDC employee Ken Dooley was unharmed when his home was shot into four times. The following day, his co-worker Linda Adair's home had a Molotov cocktail thrown into it and her home was firebombed. Following the attacks, both Ken and Linda received threatening phone calls from a woman claiming to have been abused at the hands of both employees while at the YDC. However, they couldn't identify the caller's voice. Judith would later confess to both crimes and making the phone calls. You know, like when she does some really fucked up shit. We'll get to that part. According to Judith, around this time, Alvin began saying he wanted to have sex with a virgin, and she needed to get one for him, which I'm sure really aggravated the fucking shit out of him because she just shat two hams out of her fucking coot box after giving herself to him. (sighs) Fucking pig. Sorry. Anyways... So, he was saying he wanted some hippity-dippity, like, from a virgin, and he told her that she had to go, but Alvin would say that Judith picked the girls because she wanted to have power and control over them. Police agreed with Alvin on this, though, about Judith, that she was the alpha in the relationship, enjoying being in power. She demonstrated this when she and Alvin committed their first abduction and murder. Lisa Ann Milliken was a 13-year-old girl from Cedartown, Georgia. Lisa was a resident at the Ethel Harpst Home, which is a facility for abused and neglected children, both boys and girls. So, this isn't in the script, but this is what I do recall about Lisa. Lisa had began being sexually abused at the age of 11. At some point... She and her three siblings were removed from the home and they were all placed in different facilities. So this is why she's there. Okay, now on September 25th, 1982, she and a group of the residents went on a trip to the River Bend Mall in Rome, Georgia, which is approximately like 20 miles away from Cedartown. At some point, Lisa was separated from her group. Alvin and Judith had been prowling the arcade in the mall, which I assume was bustling with after-school adolescent activity. And obviously, you know, at the time when malls were, like, super active and bustling, and there were arcades, especially, like, in the 70s and the 80s, predators really used that, you know, especially pedophiles and people like that. They really did use arcades and stuff to, like, target kids. (sighs) Anywho, so 
Alvin ponied up to a game and began playing. While he did that, Judith looked for the perfect girl to abduct. The first girl she approached was Suzanne Klontz. Judith asked if she was alone at the mall and if she wanted to drive around for a while. Suzanne said that after seeing the dead look in Judith's eyes, she quickly declined. Rebounding quickly, Judith observed Lisa. Now, Lisa was obviously displaced from the residents in her group, you know, that she came to the mall with, but she was at the arcade, and she was slightly skittish, as there were some teens looking her up and down, which was like a trauma for her, and it was a trigger, and she was, you know, having been abused by men in her past, Judith saw this, because Judith is an intelligent young woman, she saw this as the perfect time to step in and engage with Lisa, the perfect predator. And she, you know, and Lisa chatted openly with Judith. Again, perfect predator move. Judith being a young female, because she herself is a teenager, approaches Lisa, another teenager. And while she might be a little bit older, she's still a teenager and she's a girl. Now, you're more open to talking to someone of the same sex and feeling more comfortable in a situation when you're uncomfortable, you know. Um, and so that's exactly what happened here. So while Judith was setting her trap, Lisa's caregivers were searching the mall to no avail for her. Now, see, I would have been checking the fucking arcade first off the rip, just knowing how teenagers are, especially like a 13 year old. I would have been, I would have checked that arcade first. So it's unknown if the twins were with Judith and Alvin in the arcade, but it's presumed the couple, you know, took their separate cars to escape, making Lisa feel more comfortable leaving the mall with Judith. And, I mean, like, it's also been said that, like, they were known to leave the kids, like, in the car, which is bullshit, okay? And they were babies. So the couple were polar opposites. Alvin preferred a clean car while Judith was always lit was always littered. The two would constantly bicker and argue when in the same car as, well, you know, like, all of Bobby and Whitney, you know, they were always, like, rock'em, sock'em robots and shit. Um, also... It's also said that Alvin loved himself some fast food, fast food, junk food, while Judith and the twins pretty much sustained themselves off of like peanut butter sandwiches. So like they were both equally fucking disgusting and had really gnarly habits, but like their eating habits are something that were mentioned quite a bit. Um, throughout the research that I got so I just thought I'd throw that out there and also because of the way that they preferred their vehicles I think it's interesting that Lisa or Judith's car was always littered with like food wrappers and things of that sort whereas Alvin was the one who loved to eat fast food burgers and yet he kept a really clean whip anyways while in the car, Judith and Alvin maintained contact over CB, over the CB radio, using the handles Lady Sundown and Night Rider. Alvin and Judith crossed state lines with Lisa, eventually holding her captive in a motel room in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. An employee recalled Judith walking into the motel with Lisa close by. The employee also recalled seeing Alvin shortly thereafter and then again repeatedly going to vending machines to feed his junk food addiction. When the three did enter the room initially, Judith is said to have pulled a gun on Lisa and told her that she was going to do whatever she was told to do or else. While Lisa was in the motel room, she was sexually abused, raped, and molested by both Alvin and Judith. Lisa was gagged and tied to the bed. For the next four days, Lisa lied to hide lay tied and gagged in bed as Judith sexually assaulted and Alvin raped her. The couple took turns beating Lisa as the twins sat off in the distance in the room and watched. At night, Lisa was handcuffed to the, fr the bed frame and forced to sleep on the floor cold and naked. While there was another bed in the room, the couple furthered their abuse towards Lisa by treating her like an animal. After holding up in the room for four days, the Neelys became bored with Lisa and decided it was time to move on, but feared identification by Lisa. It was decide that, decided that they couldn't take Lisa back to Georgia, so Judith decided to kill Lisa. 
After making sure that no one was around, Judith snuck Lisa out of the motel room and handcuffed her inside of her car. From there, Judith drove Lisa to a remote canyon in DeKalb County, Georgia. Judith parked her car and directed Lisa to get out of the car and lie down. Judith then made Lisa wrap her arms around a tree where she handcuffed her arms around it. Judith then produced a syringe loaded with Drano and injected it into Lisa's neck. Judith would claim that she injected Lisa with Drano thinking it would be a quicker manner of death, but that didn't happen. Lisa began howling in pain as the poison coursed through her bloodstream and began writhing in pain on the ground. Judith, the sadist, then injected Lisa with an unknown substance, which also didn't kill Lisa quick enough. So Lisa was still conscious through all of this and pleaded with Judith to let her go back to the Ethel Harpst home. Judith forced Lisa to walk around, hoping that the two injections would begin to kick in and take effect, but it didn't work. While holding Lisa at gunpoint and getting frustrated that the Drano cocktail wasn't working, she handcuffed Lisa again and injected her arms and buttocks with three separate syringes, giving a few minutes between each to allow them to, quote, work. Lisa's skin began to bubble and foam from the injections of cleaning and drain products Judith pumped into her arm, but she still remained conscious. Reaching her fill with her attempts at killing Lisa, Judith finally made her walk to the edge of a nearby cliff. Lisa continually pleaded for her life, but Judith was on a mission. Judith shot Lisa in the head and pushed her over the cliff. It was about an 80-foot drop from the cliff's edge to the jutted-out tree limb that Lisa's body landed on. Judith had fallen on the ground as she was pushing Lisa over and after seeing blood on her jeans quickly changed into a spare pair she had inside her car. Litter bug Judith tossed the bloody jeans and syringes over the cliff's edge before riding off to be with Alvin and the twins. A few days after the murder, Judith called a local radio station giving them detailed information on the location of Lisa's body. She also called the Rome police, giving them the same detailed information. Upon their first search of the area, they were unable to locate the body and most likely assumed it was a, co- a hoax. Frustrated that Lisa's body had not yet been recovered, Judith called the Del Calp, De Calp, geez, Louise, you can speak, can really, county sheriff's office and informed them of where to find Lisa's body. This time saying that she, the caller, was responsible for, quote, leaving Lisa's body at the location in the canyon. This time, when the search was conducted, 13-year-old Lisa Ann's remains were discovered, along with the physical evidence left behind by Judith. On October 3, 1982, Judith approached Diane Bobo, asking her if she wanted to go for a ride, but Diane declined. The following day, Judith approached 13-year-old Debbie Smith, who was walking home from school. She also declined the invitation. Both would say that they got an uneasy feeling from Judith. Debbie's mother would report the incident, as well as a recorded uh, voice message left on her answering machine, and this is like, I think like within like a day or two later that was left by an unidentified woman who claimed to be the woman who had tried to abduct Debbie. So she lets the police know about this and Debbie was able to identify Alvin and Judith through a photo lineup. But that was it. Like just, just a photo. Feeling deflated by Diane and Debbie later that evening... Judith drove alongside couple Janice Chapman and John Hancock. Judith told them that she was lonely and in need of some companionship. She asked if they minded riding around with her and her twins for a bit. Janice didn't feel uneasy, so she said yes. John, who was a grave digger by trade and newly converted Christian, pushed aside his initial feelings of reservation and agreed to go along with Judith and Janice. Janice had some learning disabilities, and uh, for her, the car ride was exciting. 
As the group set off into the night, Judith switched on her CB radio. Knight Rider began talking, and Lady Sundown answered immediately. She drove the group down a dirt road north of Rome, and Alvin pulled up in his pickup truck. Alvin suggested that John ride with him, and Janice ride with Judith and the twins. John wasn't super cool with this, but didn't want to damper Janice's happiness to be riding around with new friends. They all set out for a small, like, watering hole and hole-in-the-wall type bar with cheap drinks that Alvin had suggested, but stopped when John said that he had to, you know, drain the wheeze. He had to use the bathroom. While they were standing, while he was along the side of the road using the bathroom, John could hear Alvin and Judith whispering not too far from him saying that basically if they were going to do it now is the time to get it done and then judith approached john at gunpoint judith ordered him to walk with her and he followed her orders when he asked if he could speak to janice judith coldly said hell no she then told john that she and alvin would be taking care of janice alvin shouted at judith to hurry up and get it over with and with that, John felt the cold burn of the bullet ripping through his shoulder. The force of the shot propelling John onto his stomach, where he played dead as the Neelys and Janice drove away. After it was safe, John dragged himself to the side of the road where he tried to flag down help. A good Samaritan would in fact find John on the side of the road and rush him to the hospital. While there, he was able to give police an excellent description of both Alvin and Judith, although he only knew them by their CB names, Knight Rider and Lady Sundown. Similarly, like with Lisa, Judith and Alvin took Janice to a cheap motel where they abused and raped her. Judith was especially cruel to Janice, mocking her mental handicaps and speech impediments. The following day, Judith decided to get rid of Janice. Judith took Janice to a remote area in Chattooga County. Judith marched Janice away from the car and shot her. Janice screamed in pain, which further infuriated Judith. So Judith shot Janice two more times in the chest. After being discharged from the hospital, John was asked to come down to the police station to take a polygraph test to eliminate him as a suspect in the disappearance of Janice because of course we don't know that she's murdered at this point amazingly though while John is waiting he heard Judith's voice coming from a nearby room in the station a recording of the voice message judith left debbie smith's home after her attempted abduction was being played john told the officers that the voice on the recording was the voice of the woman who had shot him and taken janice police now had multiple credible witnesses who identified alvin judith and their vehicles alvin and judith were crashing at barbara's trailer in murfreesboro now that janice had been murdered Judith attempted to rent a room at a local motel using a bad check and was arrested. When Detective Kynes, who was working John shooting, Janice's abduction, and Lisa Ann's murder, heard that Judith was in custody in Murfreesboro, he knew he finally had the Neelys where he wanted them. A search of Barbara's trailer provided police with further evidence when the couple's kill kit was discovered. Inside the kit, handcuffs, guns, knives, and masks. Alvin would also be arrested that week, telling police that he could give them the location of Janice's body. Alvin insisted that while he knew where Janice's body was located, he had nothing to do with her murder. Alvin drew police a map and then, and the badly decomposed remains of Janice were recovered. With the remains of Janice recovered, Alvin and Judith turned on one another. Alvin would assert that Judith was responsible for all the dank shit they'd done. Alvin said that Judith was the one in charge in the relationship. Police viewed Alvin as being a weak follower as well. They believed that for the most part, Judith ran the kneeling relationship, but they also believed that Alvin 
you know, played a major role in a lot of the fucked up shit that they did. In contrast, Judith would say that Alvin was the dominant figure in their relationship, only going along with his shenanigans and wickedness out of fear. When asked if she was afraid of her husband or if he was abusive, Judith would claim he was. Boney and Claude, as they lovingly called each other, should have been bonehead and fuckface, um, had become Kramer versus Kramer, each pointing finger fingers at the other, placing all responsibility for the heinous acts they committed together as a couple at each other's feet entirely. To avoid the death penalty, Alvin pleaded guilty to murder and aggravated assault in Georgia. Alvin was never charged in the murder of Lisa Milliken. Right before Judith's March 7, 1983 trial for the murder of Lisa Ann Milliken could could begin, Judith gave birth to her third child while in custody. Judith's trial lasted for six weeks, where she was eventually found guilty for the torture and murder of Lisa Ann Milliken. While the jury felt 18-year-old Judith should receive life in prison, Judge Randall Cole sentenced Judith to death by electrocution in the Alabama in the Alabama State Department of Corrections. After her conviction for the torture murder of Lisa Milliken, Judith pleaded guilty to the murder of Janice Chapman. Alvin was incarcerated at Bostick State Prison from 1983 until October 2005 when he died. At 18, Judith was the youngest woman given a death sentence in the United States. Judith was placed on death row at Alabama's Julia Tutwiler Prison for Women. In 1989, the Supreme Court affirmed her death um, her death sentence. Sorry, my phone decided to start making weird shit happen because I said the word okay. And let me make that go away. On June 15th, 1999, days away from her death sentence, Judith's execution was commuted by Governor Fob James, you can't make this shit up, to life in prison with the eligibility of parole in 15 years. This decision was controversial because Governor James had a history of being hard on crime and the overturning of Judith's death sentence was unexpected, especially since the nature of Judith's crimes were so heinous. Judith would have been eligible in 2014, however, in 2003, Alabama legislature passed a law making her ineligible. As of 2018, Judith has still been denied parole. So, what had happened is this. Huh. Natural born killers, anyone? Um, there's so, Bonnie, I I guess Bonnie and Clyde, if that's, who they wanted to model themselves after but I don't I don't really fucking see it as a Bonnie and Clyde situation um it definitely wasn't a Bonnie and Clyde situation because the two of them turned on one another so they definitely were not ride or die for each other like they initially thought that they or asserted that they were um Alvin lived a charmed life growing up and everything was handed to him he was put on a fucking pedestal he was told that he was the golden child he could do no wrong when he started fucking up and getting into things that he had no business getting into because he lacked the education the intellect the chutzpah if you will to get out there and nut up and be a man and work and earn a living uh and he decided to just be a grifter and a crook uh that was one thing because he was a small time crook i honestly do not believe that if he had not met had he not met judith i do not believe that alvin would have escalated I don't think that he would have. I really don't. I honestly believe that a lot of this 
um, as far the stuff that they did in the beginning of their relationship absolutely was all on him but I believe that Judith had a lot of insecurities and she took pleasure in committing these atrocities against these young women I honestly do believe that Judith was the fucking predator in that regard Judith was born into you know a meh familial situation and everything was okay-ish until her dad died and I mean I'm not again you know me say it every time I don't judge sex work but I am absolutely coming for you Barbara I'm coming for you for being a nasty fucking slut box who would literally bang duders with just a blanket dividing the room that you shared with your daughter who was then being oogled ogled and like had advances me towards her from nasty ass men who were there to pay you for sex you're a horrible fucking human being and you never should have been a mother bitch should have been she never should have been a mother she probably would have been a horrible fucking pet owner too um so there's that you know like some people should not have children she was absolutely one of those people and it's sad that it took her husband to die for her to like i honestly think it's like for her true colors to come out i really feel like she was probably a piss poor lackluster fucking housewife before her husband died and then he died and she just went downhill drastically and then just settled into like being in the company of different men which is whatever you know what i mean like that's fine but to let your little girl your nine-year-old see a caravan of dick coming through the door that is traumatic to have your older children not do anything because you're a whore and you can't tell your kids honestly i mean yeah you could tell your kids to do better but if you're not even fucking setting the table for dinner in between blowjobs i'm sorry to be so graphic with you guys but this shit is really pissing me off now that i think about this some more um if you cannot be a present parent for your kids and separate the fact that you're doing this shit so that you could provide for your kids and put your foot down and demand some fucking respect in your house and some fucking order you should never have fucking kids you're fucking trash so fuck you barbara because your daughter was impressionable no wonder she ended up in the hands of a fucking predator because sorry not sorry i don't give a fuck about star-crossed lovers she was a child he was a fucking adult he was an adult he was 26 years old and she was 14 15 years old when they met the two do not fucking mix okay that is an adult that's a fucking predator move i don't give a fuck if he intellectually had the fucking brain of an eight-year-old that is an adult man she was a little girl he knew what the fuck he was doing he was sexually advanced he knew what the hell he was doing she had vowed never to have sex or at least not to have sex until she met the one or until she got married or graduated from school made something for herself became a nurse you know shattered generational fucking curses living in murphy's borough in the fucking trailer park okay being in the fucking tp sucks i know i've been there not that one but yeah whatever anyways but so there's that then the two of them get together she's young she's impressionable because he was already a criminal doing shit he's teaching her the ropes and being young and impressionable she's like okay because she was starry-eyed she had rose-colored glasses and she was in that fog of euphoria of being with someone her prince charming had arrived she was no longer cinderella under you know you know lock and key from the wicked stepmother and the stepsisters no 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 she was free she fucking ran away okay then she gets pregnant she miscarries they're living they're down they're downtrodden they're living in their car they're couch surfing they're living in cheap motels they're resorting to penny any crimes to like feed themselves and provide shelter and booze or whatever you know and then next thing you know she gets in trouble she's pregnant with these damn twins and she's still a kid 
and he's a grown ass man not to mention hello mcfucking fly he had three children with his first wife so by the time he and judith were like caught he had a total of six fucking kids and he wasn't even 30 years old let that shit sink in under 30 with six kids two wives and a criminal rap sheet longer than a fucking CVS receipt what the fuck and I feel like once those twins came he started looking at Judith a little bit differently because she was no longer bright eyed and bushy tailed with shiny pretty hair she looked like fucking shit she was greasy she was sleepless her tits were probably leaking everywhere because of the babies when they were first born you know what I mean and then he gets into her head and he's like you know what little girl you're not little girl enough for me I need something fresher and I guarantee you that's where the bitch went fucking nutty and then she snapped because she's a teenager she's a child she is still her brain was still developing okay and I believe the jealousy kicked it she saw these pretty girls she per, she she was gonna give in she was gonna give her husband what he wanted but she was gonna make these bitches pay for being what her husband wanted and what she no longer was and that's where the torture and the abuse came in and then because she was young just like we saw with the french murders when we saw ryan unruh and greg lund making all of these attempts to try to you know kill rita french thinking that because they saw something on television that or a movie that it would be so easy to kill another human being she goes and she injects lisa ann milliken with all of these various cleaning products and instead of making it a quick death she makes this girl suffer and instead of fucking just i'm sorry like but she had a gun she could have shot her and put her out of her misery off the rip she could have shot and killed her to begin with but what i believe is because she had her for four days and this girl continued to beg and plead for her life and to go back to you know the ethel harpst home to be with you know to to be back with those people you know it triggered the shit out of judith and also it pissed her off you know so she made her pay she tortured her She tortured her because she watched her husband enjoying himself with her. She tortured her because she herself, being a sick, sadistic fuck, enjoyed herself with her. In that time frame that she had her. Okay? And, I mean, come on. That shit was premeditated as fuck. The way she... Because you don't just show up with preloaded fucking syringes. Okay? There's that. Okay? Then we go on with the abduction of John and Janice and the torture and abuse that she doled out on Janice and poor Janice I don't want to say she was feeble minded because she wasn't but because she suffered from mental disabilities she was naive and she wasn't understanding what was happening she didn't understand what they were doing to her necessarily especially not off at the beginning when they were abducting her you know and it bothers me so badly that judith being thinking that she was superior than janice would mock her you know and make fun of her that tells you everything you need to know about judith judith enjoyed being in power and she enjoyed being in control judith enjoyed humiliating the fucking dog piss out of people and she enjoyed taking them down several notches I just say thank goodness all of the other girls got away unscathed but my goodness the shit that they did the shit that they did and fuck you governor fob james for you know overturning shit but shout out to alabama legislature for passing that law in 2003 making her ineligible because could you imagine having this monster back on the streets i honestly do not believe that given the sheer viciousness and heinousness of her crimes that she would have turned a new leaf honestly 
I think that she is possibly one of the most dangerous people that we currently have housed in a correctional facility presently in the United States of America. Possibly the world. That's just my own personal opinion. And with that being said, I don't think that she should ever be eligible for parole. I think that she needs to be that lump that we pay for until she fucking dies where she's at. Because she'll get out because she was a child when she was incarcerated, when she was put on death row. All she learned was how to hook and crook from other criminals. I don't think that this woman, she let her, she had her babies in tow. I don't think that she would be the person that would have been reformed. I think that she would have gotten out and she would have still played that teenager bullshit and somebody else would end up getting hurt or killed at her hands or at her, you know, insistence. That's what I think. I think that Judith was a fucking low-key mastermind. Even as a teenager. Also, kind of like uh, Doug French. How he masterminded the murder of his mother. You know? I think that some kids can be changed, but I think that other people cannot. And I think that Judith and... You are not one of them. All right, guys. So that is our episode of What Had Happened, a true crime podcast. Hope you guys decompress after this one. Uh, It'll be the last one for the month. Hit you guys off something solid at the beginning of October. Hope you enjoyed that gorgeous Pisces moon. Oh, my goodness. The moon was in Pisces this week. It was delicious. I'm a Pisces, so I'm about that life. I hope you enjoy the leaves turning as we go from hot as balls to crisp like apple cider and fall. I hope you guys are well. Hope you guys are safe. Hope you guys keep listening to keep telling people. The numbers are great. You guys are amazing. I love you all so much. Thank you again. I'm Kimberly. This is what had happened to True Crime Podcast. Let's roll that beautiful outro music.